from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to part four of Every Photo is a Story. I'm Christy Feinfield, Reference Librarian in the Prints and Photographs Division at the Library of Congress. Historian Sam Waters and I are going to talk about the era in which Francis Benjamin Johnston worked. So far, we've learned about this remarkable photographer, Johnston, and a great deal about her garden photographs. It seems to me there is more to these photos than we've uncovered so far. How did Johnston's era, the world around her, influence what she brought to the photos? Sam, can you talk to me a little bit about the influences on Johnston and her work? Well, Johnston, like all of us, uh, we create and live in the world influenced by what's going on in the world. And at Johnston's time was a very pro a progressive, a social progressive era. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, very important uh, in, in the case of Johnston because one of the ways um, that the progressive era um, influenced how Americans fought mm -hmm. was through uh, the promoting of professional design, mm -hmm. of landscape, of architecture. And in the case of gardens, uh, one of the substantial uh, issues that Johnston uh, engaged with was that um, if, if, if rich people created beautiful gardens, they believed that they would influence um, people who were poor. Oh. It's a very direct relationship. Okay. And Johnston, for instance, in the slide collection, one of the discoveries, uh, which was extremely interesting, uh, was that she photographed a, a janitor's garden. And we can look at that slide of the janitor's garden and we know from the research that she showed that slide right after showing the slide of a garden, a private garden, right up the same block mm -hmm. in New York, owned by a very wealthy socialite. Right. So the comparison is absolutely a, a model, a reflective mm -hmm. of that progressive era, which is that rich person sh had her garden photographed so that the janitor some, in some imaginary way, <laughs> was going to be at a lecture and see that photograph and know how to do his own garden. So they were helping. They, they were helping were, the they rest were helping, of the world. They were helping the people less fortunate understand what was beautiful. And was that something that was going on at that time period? Were the cities needing to be more beautiful? Was well, that as you remember that Johnston, when I talked about Johnston moving to New York mm -hmm. to photograph buildings, this was all part of the City Beautiful movement. This beautification of America okay. uh, became a great subject uh, in the 19th, end of the 19th century. So another category of influence mm -hmm. you mentioned in passing was, was art. Or the, right. The so, world with, so we know that um, she was participating in a certain social movement, mm -hmm. but she also participated as an artist in the aesthetic interests of that time. And uh, she had begun as a fine artist and went right. to galleries. Right. Very France. was very interested in both new art and traditional art. Um, the other part that she would have had to know as a practicing artist, mm -hmm. photographer, were the conventions of that time that made a photograph good. And that oh, was, okay. uh, those, photogra those conventions were very, very well known at the time okay. because there were many schools uh, that were um, assembling and codifying what made a good picture. And Johnston had to know those in okay. order to make a good picture, which her clients would have known was good because they had been through the same schooling. Okay, so we can take some of the things she knew about good composition, for example, um, and compare it with one of her slides to see where she applied those principles. Right. Well, you see here a, a well-known book of the time, uh, actually uh, created by a photographer, art photographer, mm -hmm. Sadakichi Hartman, and you see uh, his, his uh, diagram of here's a good way to photograph and compose a photograph of an alley of trees, and here you see a garden in California, and you see that the photograph at absolutely follows the convention. So she knew. She knew that it was going to make it she, a good one. That's why she was successful, <laughs> because she knew the rules, yeah. and she was good at practicing them, right? okay. applying them to her own work. So another aspect which we mentioned in the last part, which was about having the slides painted, mm -hmm. is that she knew about paintings and how you would create that impression with Be the slides. Because if you were a photographer like Johnston and you wanted to be highly regarded, mm -hmm. you wanted to be regarded as an artist. And what was the highest art of that era was painting. Okay. So one way for her to always be connected to the art world was to 
uh, conceive of her photographs as paintings. Mm. And that's when the lantern slides were absolutely made for Johnston. And she uh, applied what she liked in painting mm -hmm. to the slides themselves. So we have, for instance, this interesting slide uh, of a daffodil uh, garden uh, in bloom in mm -hmm. Ohio. And if you look at this and you study uh, paintings of her era, mm -hmm. uh, you can see the very cl deep closeness of that picture to Impressionism. And here we have a landscape by uh, Monet. And you can just see where the sensibilities were uh, overlapping. And her clients and people in the world would also recognize this quality. They would have maybe seen the Monets and that. They didn't just see them, they owned them. They owned them. <laughs> so she That's right, a different set we're talking about. <laughs> right, and they, and they would have expected her to produce a slide that was as beautiful as a painting. Okay, and that was her goal. And, and that's, that's why she was successful, was because they were beautiful that way. Um, so another yeah. aspect of design, um, clearly pertinent to these images, is landscape design. So that's something you had to be, she had to be familiar with, and in researching her, you had to be familiar with. Right, so she has uh, several different issues to deal with. She has to deal with what people thought was artistically correct, which we've seen in that drawing. She mm -hmm. composed the picture right. Then she had to color it correctly so that it was like a painting. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, very significant issue was that she had to uh, find in the landscape uh, those um, views mm -hmm. that reflected its design. She couldn't just um, photograph um, her favorite bush because okay. nobody, no magazine editor was going to be interested in that. What okay. they were interested in is promoting um, certain kinds of design. Remember the mm -hmm. City Beautiful? Right. Well, magazines were all on board with this. Okay. We are going to inform the new buyer of magazines how they're going to make their house beautiful. And that meant that she went into the landscape, into the orchid, into mm -hmm. uh, gardens, knowledgeable on understanding what she's seeing. And one of those things that she would have seen, for instance, and we have, I think, of this interesting slide, um, which is uh, this, if you look at the James Garden and you look at another slide in her collection, you see the close connection of Persian gardens. Oh, um, and this is a popular thing well, at the time. Th all uh, these were considered high points of civilization. Okay. So if we were going to be a civilized country, where would we look but back to ancient civilizations okay. uh, and you know, Italy, mm -hmm. Persia, India. And she did travel and, and she see traveled. those gardens she and photograph gardens and other took a long trip, and six months tour uh, through the Middle East and, and into Europe in 1925. Wow. Um, so another example of her studying landscape design is, is from this book right here. Right. We have here uh, one, the uh, prominent uh, landscape textbook mm -hmm. uh, that was written uh, by uh, teachers at Harvard mm -hmm. and, and well-known figures in the landscape uh, architecture world. And you see here an interesting diagram. Mm -hmm. And if Johnston had this book in her library, she would have known that this, she would have been looking and saying, where is one of these successful views mm -hmm. that they are telling landscape architects they should create? So she's looking to the garden to try to find those, those she, moments. That's right. She comes and she says, where are those good moments? Where is that fine design? And we have this interesting uh, comparison to this slide uh, of, of a garden in California. And you can see what they called here an enframement mm -hmm. of the view. You can see uh, that they have done that in the California garden mm -hmm. as they did also in the James Garden. Back to the James Garden, right. so and she you found look at that these, moment there. You can see that in both the California slide and the James okay. Garden, the framing of the view. So another way that actually was probably one of your tools is you uh, with landscape plans. So the drawings that landscape architects did for their gardens would have been a useful tool something she would have known about? Well, I don't think that she often went to gardens with knowing the plans. And okay. very interestingly, uh, she didn't go with the landscape architects when she went. Mm. They sent her, and one reason, uh, the, they would send her, the, some landscape architects hired her to go photograph. But the, I think what's significant is uh, there were two people who influenced this. One was the owner who said, here's what I really it was important. Mm -hmm. And the other part is that Johnston, um, had to rely on her own experience and knowledge. But plans obviously are important. Maybe Johnston saw them, but we can see them. It's and that tells us about, uh, for instance, we have here the James Garden. And here you have a fine example of we can kind of understand better 
how this garden was laid out. So this is more of a research tool for you rather than something well, for Johnson. You must never overlook the, you never right. know what she might have known, she, right? right? She may have known uh, the, the, the Olmsted firm designed this garden. A big, a big firm, a big very firm. famous. And, and she was very um, uh, friendly with Olmsted uh, okay. through the period of the teens and the 20s and had done actually work for him a long time uh, mm -hmm. since Washington. So okay. you never know you, what she might have seen. You can speculate right. a little. Right. Absolutely. Um, Actually, going back to an, an earlier part, part two, we talked about her personal library. Right. Um, and some of the books in her library, we talked about those, those influencing her. Um, so writings about landscape and flowers and that kind of thing, that clearly steered her. And, and is there one specific one that you think you could highlight in reference to the James Garden? Well, um, those, those kind of literary influences, you must always, you need to read those books when mm -hmm. you are thinking and looking at, in period of uh, photographs, think about what people were reading. Okay. Now, interestingly, um, we can go back to this uh, photograph, I think we still have it here, of the, um, the garden. Oh, our gardener. Of the gardener uh, in the Newport uh, Garden of the, of the Jameses. Now, um, this is a, a research. Um, so back to our gardener. Uh, uh, this is a a fine example of, I knew what books jo uh, Johnston had read, and if you recall, we uh, talked about the, um, uh, we had, a, I think, a, an image of the old uh, garden book by <coughs> Mrs. Earl, mm -hmm. and um, you have that, uh, and then we have an interesting uh, idea here. Uh, there's another book that was in the library, which was uh, the uh, collection of, of Kipling. And she was a great fan of, of Rudyard Kipling, the poet. Okay. And in a very small reference, uh, in a, a note that Johnston has uh, to an and, editor. And where did you find in that? In the manuscript in collection. In the manuscript collection. There's a little okay. fine line. And at the end of it, she says that she took these photographs in order to illustrate a Kipling poem. Oh. This isn't just the garden, the lawnmower. If uh, the man mowing the lawn, mm -hmm. this is if you consider this with the other photographs in the collection of the gardeners and you read that poem, you can see that she was illustrating the poem. So when we go through these photos and we find another man in the garden, right. it wasn't about the garden. It was about this poem. That's right. This, the focus here was that if you line these all up mm -hmm. and you line it up with the poem, you find that she's not taking this for Mrs. James. She's taking this for herself to sell a special article to a magazine in this period, which would have been an illustrated, it would have been, she, they would have published the poem illustrated with photographs by Francis mm -hmm. Benjamin Johnston. Wow. So it was all about her work, about her interest. And it was very elevating in this time because to be associated as an art photographer and poetry, mm. you were, this was high culture in this period. So bringing yeah. poetry into it elevated her again, as you said, to be an artist rather than a photographer. Right, she had because she was ideas. always interested in being the artist. She didn't just want to be Mrs. James' hired hand. So uncovering that story is kind of one of the rewards of studying all this kind of thing, looking for the influences, the books she read, the things she would have seen, the design she studied, all of that. This is a great example of where it all comes together. So. We've kind of illustrated it by showing the books, but how do you get to know that era? What are, what are your best tips for getting to know the era? Well, reading the books, you know. You want to read the books. You need to read the history of that era. Mm -hmm. You need to think of the influences. What influenced a, for a person like Frances Benjamin Johnson? Who were the people she knew? What were the cities she traveled to? What were her, um, who were her friends? This is mm -hmm. all very, all part of a bigger picture. A bigger story being told there. And that means, and the best thing to do is to try and do some of that before you come to the library mm -hmm. because you can enhance your education of, of, of a Francis Benjamin Johnson while here. But if you come to a box of photographs of the James Garden and you know something about the time, you open it up and you already begin to think, why is that gardener there? Right. You never see gardeners in photographs of this period. You need to know that. You need to understand why. So you bring that knowledge to Absolutely. the table. Well, I think now is a good time to uh, do some recap and some tips for this section. So through this conversation, I feel like I've begun to understand the times that Johnston lived in and some of what shaped her thinking. Um, the top tips we can pass along at this stage are learn about the era during which the photographs were taken. How, as Sam suggested, read articles and books about the time period. Think about how and where the photographs were used or seen and how that might have influenced the content and consider photographs as works of art. Learn about the conventions for composition and visual communication. 
Please visit the website Every Photo is a Story to find definitions of key concepts. Also, another try it yourself exercise challenges you to do some research. I think we're ready to move on to the last video in our series where we interpret stories you discover. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.